Hi, and welcome to the second video in our communication unit of the course. This one is going to deal with cell signaling. I figured I'd start out here with the way that I start every day of my life, which is a cup of coffee. But not just because I love it, though I do love it, but coffee is actually a, an interesting example of taking advantage of certain cell signaling mechanisms. Of course, you know that the molecule in coffee that we all know and love is this one right here, caffeine. But you may not know how caffeine works. It turns out that caffeine works by mimicking a chemical signal known as adenosine, which also doubles as a nucleotide in nucleic acids. But in this context, adenosine is a molecule that interacts with a particular family of proteins, the adenosine receptors. And there are many different adenosine receptors, but in this particular one, you can see an adenosine molecule sitting in this receptor protein as the orange molecule within the larger purple protein. Caffeine does the same thing. It occupies that receptor and it sends the same message that adenosine does, which is something along the lines of, we're good to go, we have the energy we need in order to face another day. This is cellular signaling in the main. It is the production of chemical messages that are then received by cells and used by those cells to carry out responses. Another name for this is signal transduction. And the question that we're going to answer in this video is how do cells communicate? We're going to look at an overview of cell signaling in the broad level, and then we're going to focus in on signal transduction in multicellular systems specifically before we talk about some cell signaling logic and consequences that stem from that logic. Before we get into multicellular organisms, it's important to understand that cellular communication pathways are ancient and we see them in all lineages of life. The example that I've chosen to show this is quorum sensing in Vibrio fischeri, which are a group of bacteria that engage in cell signaling among themselves. In particular, they do this in order to produce light. Vibrio fischeri have a symbiotic relationship with the bobtail squid. They live in particular organs within the squid, and they produce light through bioluminescent pathways. This is connected to the density of the cells in the population. Regardless of the density of the population, Vibrio fischeri cells, like the one in this cartoon over here, produce and release into the environment a chemical message, the Lux I molecule, shown here as the purple blobs. These molecules serve as the inducer for an operon that's responsible for producing the enzymes necessary to engage in bioluminescence. But at a low density, there are not enough of the Lux I molecules in the environment to have this effect within Vibrio fischeri cells. As the density of the cells increases and we reach a higher cell density, the amount of Lux I molecules in the environment also increases to the point that Lux I diffuses into neighboring cells and interacts with the Lux operator, producing the enzyme luciferase, which is what causes the glowing color that you can see in this picture. It's a super cool behavior that's worth you knowing about just because of the ecology of it, but it's also an important demonstration of the notion that cellular communication predates multicellular organisms. Prokaryotic cells can absolutely communicate with each other through mechanisms like this quorum sensing pathway and use it to coordinate the behavior of the population of cells. That established, cellular communication is absolutely a requirement for multicellular organisms. Multicellular organisms have a huge diversity of different types of cellular communication pathways, some of which we've already seen in our previous discussion of the immune system. We categorize these things based on the targets of the cellular communication and how the cells are accomplishing that communication, but it's not really important for you to keep these things in your head, even though I've shown them to you here. What's more important is for you to understand that these are all different versions of the same thing. In each case, the cell is making a chemical message, which it is then exchanging with other cells or possibly with itself in order to accomplish some sort of cellular response. This is the universality of cellular communication that you really should focus on here in this discussion. Almost every cell in your body is getting almost all of its information about life and what it should be doing from other cells in your body. I know I show this diagram a lot, but I think we always focus on different things. In this particular instance, let's focus on all of the receptors that we see on the surface of the cell and all of the different molecules that can be received 
by this cell in order to carry out different communication pathways and different responses as a result. There's quite a few of them and the kinds of messages that they can send and the responses that they will engender as a result are widely diverse. So to get a handle on how this works, let's dive in and look at the specifics of signal transduction cellular communication. We'll start with the messages themselves, molecules that we'll broadly refer to as ligands. These are the chemical messages that are made, sent, and received in cellular communication systems. The chemistry of the ligand is going to play a large role in how that message is received. Things like peptide hormones and amine hormones cannot go across the cell membrane, and so they have to be received at the membrane through membrane-bound receptor proteins. Whereas signaling molecules like steroid hormones and other lipid ligands can go through the cell membrane, and they will generally be received by receptors in the cytoplasm of the cell. Let's look at membrane-based signal reception first. This image is showing us the receipt of the hormone epinephrine or adrenaline at the cell membrane. Epinephrine is an amine hormone. It cannot go through the cell membrane and it is received by the receptor shown here in red on the surface of the membrane. Once the hormone is received by the receptor and you can barely see it in the graphic labeled B, that triggers a conformational change in the receptor protein, which is then going to interact with other proteins inside of the cell, bringing that response into the cell, transducing that response. These proteins will then interact with other proteins, which will then interact with additional proteins and what we call a cascading response, eventually resulting in some sort of change in the physiology of the cell. In other words, the receptor is transducing the signal to proteins inside of the cell. That's its job. And here we can see a membrane receptor and we notice that it has a domain outside of the cell that's going to interact with the ligand and a domain inside of the cell that's going to interact with the other proteins in that signal transduction pathway. The process by which lipid-based ligand messages are received is not all that different. The main difference here is that the receptor is inside of the cytoplasm and it interacts with the ligand after the ligand enters the cell. And then generally the receptor ligand complex is the molecule that will then go and activate a cellular response directly, which is usually a change in gene expression. Let's look at one specific example of a signal transduction pathway, a widely distributed one in our bodies that's known as G-protein linked reception. And in particular, we'll look at the G-protein linked reception. This is an amine hormone, so it will be received at the cell membrane with a membrane-bound receptor, and we can see that happening here. Once that reception occurs, the receptor protein will interact with a G-protein. G-proteins are incredibly common proteins for membrane-based signal reception, and the reason they're called G-proteins is because they will use GTP molecules, or guanine triphosphate molecules, in order to carry out their transduction response. They will activate other proteins in the pathway by adding phosphates from the GTP molecule to activate those proteins, which is then activating the enzyme adenocyclase, causing it to produce molecules of cyclic AMP, a second messenger. We'll talk about those in a second. But before we do, let's consider the overall nature of cellular responses. Cellular responses to receive signals ultimately fit in a couple of big categories. They can be metabolic, the cell can change the enzymatic reactions happening inside of it. They can be gene expression changes, so the cell can start making new proteins or stop making other proteins, or they can be functional changes. The cell can rearrange its internal functionality. It can change the way that the cytoskeleton is oriented. It can do a variety of different things, and frequently it will do multiple things at once. The specifics of the cellular response are not only going to depend upon the particular receptors that are present in the cell, but they're also going to depend upon the internal structure and the internal proteins and the genes that are available to be transcribed or not transcribed as a result. And this all depends upon the particular type of cell we're talking about. And if that's confusing, to you, you should probably go back and check out our discussions on cellular differentiation from our regulation unit. The cyclic AMP is kind of an interesting molecule because it serves as what we call a second messenger, a molecule that's present inside of a cell that serves a similar purpose to the ligand that was received at the beginning of the signal transduction pathway. That was the first messenger. The second messenger is produced internally, but will then go and interact with other proteins inside of the cell to relay additional features of the signal transduction response. In the case of the receipt of epinephrine and the activation of adenocyclase by the G protein in the transduction pathway, the production of AMP is going to trigger a variety of specific cellular responses that are particular to the internal details of the cell that's receiving the message. 
but the proteins that are going to be activated after adenocyclase begins production of AMP are going to be activated directly by those cyclic AMP molecules binding with them. That's a second messenger. I'm sure it won't surprise you to know that cyclic AMP is not the only second messenger that we see inside of cells, but it's certainly a great example of one. Moving back up a level of abstraction from the nitty gritty details of a G protein linked signal transduction response, let's look at the overall logic of cell signaling. Cellular communication is both networked and overlapping. The different communication pathways will operate simultaneously and in different combinations with internal proteins in the pathways frequently responding to multiple different cues from different cell signaling pathways. And you can see that in the diagram. It's also cascading. One protein will activate another protein that will activate another protein and so on. The notion of a cascade is pretty universal in complex systems and certainly cell communication systems are no different. To get a handle on this, we'll go back to our adrenaline example, which has been studied to the point where we can start to understand the numbers that are involved. One molecule of adrenaline binding to its receptor on a cell will activate something like 100 G proteins. These G proteins through their action will result in the production of 10,000 cyclic AMP molecules. Each cyclic AMP molecule will activate one protein kinase A, so 10,000 copies of protein kinase A will all be activated by that one bound adrenaline. Those protein kinase A's will each activate something like 10 phosphorylase kinase enzymes, so we'll have a total of 100,000 active phosphorylase kinases from the binding of that one adrenaline molecule. Each phosphorylase kinase will in turn activate 10 additional glycogen phosphorylases for a total of a million active glycogen phosphorylase enzymes in the cell as a result of the binding of that one bound adrenaline. And each of those glycogen phosphorylases will in turn produce something along the lines of 10 glucose molecules to be available for the cell to use for energy. So that one bound adrenaline molecule will result in the generation of 100 million glucose subunits available for the cell to use. That's a remarkably amplified signal and it's all due to the overlapped networked interactions of cellular signaling cascades. While we're here, let's pause to note that protein kinases and protein phosphorylases are very common proteins that we see in signal transduction pathways. And the reason for that is because they transfer phosphates from donor molecules like ATP onto other molecules in order to activate those molecules and give them the energy that's required for the cellular response. For the cellular response. Thanks so much for watching our discussion on the specific details of signal transduction pathways in cellular communication. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can describe the common features of signal transduction across all biological lineages, the kinds of things that serve as the signal and the ways in which those signals are received and that cells respond as a result. Make sure that you can explain how a ligand mediated signal is converted into a cellular response. And finally, make sure that you can explain how signal transduction systems produce signal cascades in cells and the resulting effects of those cascades. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment here at the end of the video and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.